Bill Sarukas talks about a time where he had an adverse reaction to some of the evidence he was booking. Did you ever see anybody uh, from the effects of the acid that was being sold in the school? I, I can't recall seeing anything that, that stuck out to me at that time. I, I didn't know what the effects were going in um, until one day when I experienced it, when I, when I bought um, several pieces of blotter acid at a local restaurant from, from a kid. Um, I had gotten the, the substance on my fingers and licked the envelope that I put them in. And the rest of that day, um, what was blurry to me (laughs) and we, we were not able to make a case on that particular purchase. Welcome to game of crimes. everybody, welcome back. This is going to be yet another marvelous, fascinating, scintillating, titillating, hey, just watch amazing, hey, 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 Game of Crimes. I am Morgan Wright. I am the ultimate host on the show and I'm joined literally by my partner in crime. Steve Murphy, but everybody calls me Murph. An ultimate, uh, you know, I don't know, it's alternative host. I don't know what you are. Alternative, man. could be alternative host, yes. But hey, anyway, regardless of that, thank you guys for joining us. Hey, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, just head on over to that Apple review and Spotify. Give us the five stars, the Cinco stars, because we try really hard. We ought to get an A for effort, if nothing else, just an A for effort. Like, you know, we ought to get a participation trophy and that includes five stars. Don't you think Murph? Absolutely. I mean, (laughs) I'm shocked at how many, (laughs) how much recording we do. It's unbelievable. It's fun. It's fun. And and so it it really helps us out a lot, guys. We sincerely appreciate it. Appreciate all your great comments you leave there. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com, for everything. We're going to be working on new types of merch. Thanks to some of you folks out there, and you know who you are, like Katie. Uh, but uh, we've got our book list over there, which our book our book from uh, the last episode, The Unexpected Spy. We'll talk about that in a minute with Tracy Walder. Also, follow us on the social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, and on the Instagram. But Steve. Hmm. Where you got to be. I know. It's you Patreon. Patreon.com right. slash Game of Crimes. We just got through doing our Q&A for this month. What fun. I mean, we had questions. Really good. Qu- I mean, just, you know, you think, can you do Q&A every month? The questions get the same. No, I'm telling you, we've got f- folks out there that are giving us great questions all the time new takes on it. And so we, we really thought it was uh, some really good uh, Q&A. But we've got, hey, guess what? The reason you got to join too, Steve, is what we're working on right now. It's our super secret project, which I'll tell everybody about. Don't tell anybody except all your friends and everybody you know, and including all your neighbors. But <laughs> if you are at the Guardian of the Realm or Warden of the Throne level, we will have a new special edition, Real DEA Narcos on the Real DEA Narcos, Cali edition. Yep. We have Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell, the guys who season three was made about, talk about their two and a half year investigation to take down the gentleman. Allegedly, of the Cali cartel. I tell you what, man, I'm so excited about that. Uh, I've never really sat down and talked to Chris and Dave, and and they also had Jerry Salama was involved in it. Ruben Prieto, those are the four main people. Uh, but they're telling stories that I never dreamt were going on up there in Cali. They were doing things that Javier and I and I were not doing in in Medellin. So this is you got to come on and listen to this. It's phenomenal, and we've already done four hours of recording. I've got a feeling we're going to end up with 10, 12 hours before this thing is over. This They got some fantastic stories. Oh, and it just, it goes on and on just, and so many, and the history and the backstory of everything. So Patreon's where you got to be. I'll tell you, our 911, we have so many comments about that. 911, what's your emergency? Got Murph on the last one, didn't I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> gotcha. well, 50, We're not going to but... give it away, but you got to watch it. Murph thought one <laughs> thing and it ended up being another. So nanny, nanny. Yep, and I just want to mention that Q&A. That is my favorite thing that we do on Patreon because the questions come from the listeners, and they're not simple questions. What color T-shirt are you wearing today, Murph? Because everybody knows I wear free T-shirts. I'm actually wearing one I bought today, just so you know. But uh, it's challenging questions, and we're getting the opportunity to tell stories that jogs our memories, and I, I love it. I just I really enjoy doing the Q&A. So come over and join us there. Just see what it's all about. Absolutely. And so, but make sure you do that. And if you want to head on over to paypal.com, use our email, game of crimes podcast at gmail.com. 
or paypal.me slash Game of Crimes, whatever it makes it easier for you to support the show and help us bring you even more exciting content. Now, real quick disclaimer, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but... As you already can tell, we never take ourselves serious. We're going to talk about serious topics, but we're going to have some fun. And speaking of serious topics, we got a lot of great feedback on episode 39. Tracy Walder, the unexpected spy, a CIA officer and a FBI special agent. Stories of uh, uh, terrorism and espionage. What a great episode. She is unbelievable. You know, uh, and I think I said before, I wasn't sure how the interview was going to go uh, just because so much that she was involved with was classified and she can't talk about it. And that lady is one true American patriot. Very proud to know her, proud to have her on the show. Fantastic job, Tracy. Thank you very, very much. But you got to listen to the lead into part two. Let's see how a highly trained CIA case officer handles a six-year-old. We have a surprise for you. <laughs> That's fantastic. That was the best you, part of the show. <laughs> yeah, you kind of listen to the intro to part two. That's so good. So anyway, but anyway, but as we say, we take the story seriously, but not ourselves. And because of that, we have a dedicated time in our show where we do something that's not very serious. So guess what time that is, Murph? Uh, I think it's time for Small, Small Town Police Slaughter. Yes. <laughs> this is going to be fun this time because guess what? All of the stories come from you, our fabulous fans. And the first one comes from, and I'm going to butcher this name, so I apologize, but Mikey Vlamink, M-A-A-I-K-E, Mikey Vlamink, comes out of our Game of Crimes fan group. Now, this one comes from New Albany. I believe it's uh, Mississippi. And uh, population, 7,626. Salute. (laughs) All right, New Albany, man. Steve, you're going to love this. Familiar theme in this one. New Albany man jailed for shooting at helicopters. A New Albany man is facing federal charges after he allegedly shot at helicopters. According to a complaint filed in federal court in Oxford Tuesday, Gary Kerbo, 60 of County Road 96, New Albany, has fired at helicopters at least five times with a 12-gauge shotgun over the last four weeks. <laughs> News for you, pal. That's not going to bring him down. <laughs> federal prosecutors, Steve, here's, comes the, here, comes the, here comes the money line. Federal prosecutors have asked for a mental evaluation. No shit, who claimed the military helicopters were using lasers to shoot and kill his cattle, that the helicopters had been dropping methamphetamine on his property, and that the military had used a satellite hookup to send signals to choke him while he was eating. Hey, pal, I got to tell you, they're not going to waste good methamphetamine on your cows. What the hell? (laughs) What's the altitude of the helicopter? I got to know. Do you know? Oh. I, I don't know. I mean, but you know, even if it's a thousand feet, you're not going to, that shotgun right. is not getting anywhere near it. <laughs> you're going to get about 50 yards. <laughs> See, if you're lucky. Oh my God. Well, guess what? This, uh, this next one comes uh, to us also Shane Bauer from our game of crimes fan group. Right. And this one comes out of Truman, Arkansas, Truman population, 7,399. Salute. Salute. All right. Steve though, this one though, it, like he says, only from Arkansas. Five people faced theft charges after police say they stripped nearly a half a million dollars worth of metal off of a business's roof. According to a news release from the Truman Police Department, the suspects are accused of stealing $470,542.72 worth of metal from the roof of True Cab on Milton Avenue. Police said they peeled off the metal flasking to sell. I didn't know there was a half a million dollars worth of metal oh on a building gosh. like that. Oh, I, my God. You know, I, I'll tell you, I do remember cases where thieves would, uh, when I was a railroad cop, they would uh, knock down the, the telegraph lines, and then they would build fires, and they'd melt the rubber rubberized coating off the, the copper. copper. Yeah. But I've never heard anybody steal the roof. <laughs> so uh, five people were arrested, but the two apparently ringleaders, James Williams and Carl Holt, got charged with commercial burglary theft to $25,000 or more, criminal mischief, theft by receiving scrap metal, and they were being held on a $100,000 bond. Wow. You know, we were recording yesterday, and I had my Arkansas shirt on. I wish I had it on today. Sorry. Just say no. We just tell you. We tell you, just say no. (laughs) You know, it's got to weigh a ton on top of that. Why steal something easier, man? Jeez, what idiots. Oh, yeah. You know, and for some reason... My third story disappeared off of here. Can you believe that? I was using Google Docs. Where did my third story go to? 
Well, buddy, we call that Murphy's Law, and you work with Murphy, so sorry. <laughs> I got it. Well, I'm going to, hey, in the meantime, while I'm trying to figure out what that went, instead of doing what year was it, because Murph has an abysmal record on what year was it. Hey, I'm doing pretty I'm good this year. I'm just going to simply, what's that? I was doing pretty good this year. Yeah, well, this year, I mean, we're, I'm talking about overall, you're you're like three for 40, so <laughs> don't, 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 don't get a big head yet. So, But hey, this one actually, and the reason I want to read this, a good buddy of mine, Rick Zach, um, I don't want to get into details. I was just on the phone with him today, but he dodged, let's say for guys his age, he just, he got good news. He dodged the big one, but good. he has been recovering. Um, and he says that, guess, guess who his... We are his inspiration. He takes us on his walks. So wow. I told him as he as he recovers and rehabs, he takes us on his walks. So anyway, he See, sends we're us this article. We're therapeutic. <laughs> oh, we're something. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so what he sent us, and I thought I would read you Weird Story of the Day. We're going to have another section we just call Weird Story of the Day. All right. Because it doesn't matter. Okay, right, Steve? Yep. Here's the headline. Stolen box of human heads investigated by Denver police. Oh, what? This sounds like something out of Mexico. No. Denver police are investigating the theft of a box containing human heads from a parked freight company truck. Officials said Saturday the box was being transported for medical research purposes. Someone broke into the truck while it was parked. Uh, Between Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning, the blue and white box was marked with a label that said, Exempt human specimen. A dolly was also stolen. No arrests have been made as of Saturday, and investigators are asking anybody who finds the box to call the police. Oh, so, my gosh. Well, you know, you got to steal the dolly because that way it doesn't look suspicious when you're, bo- you know, carting a box of human heads down a freaking street. <laughs> the hell? You know, uh, well, you know what they say, Steve, two heads are better than one. Oh, well, how many is eight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, I, oh, I, I don't even. Now, the only reason we're saying this, folks, don't go ballistic on us. The only reason we're saying this is because these were medical specimens. People agreed to have that we would not do this if this were a terrorism case and people were decapitated and stuff. This don't don't these everybody just calm down, take a breath. But it just it's a great example of how st- crazy, stupid, idiotic, morons, moronic yep. people can be out there that they'll steal anything. They'll steal anything. Well, hey, and guess what? Somebody stole my third story. So rather than belabor it, we're just going to get on with the All episode. Right. So let's go, brother. I'll bring that to you next week. So hey, anyway, so this one's a good one too. Uh, this is a friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, Bill Sarukas, and uh, we got a couple quick stories about to set this up because Steve, you got a great story too. But Bill, when he was at the U.S. Marshals, I ended up doing some work with him. Uh, he was obviously associated with the show America's Most Wanted. I say obviously because the U.S. Marshals were a part of that. Uh, he works with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids, doing investigations on long-term missing or on abductions. I mean, just what a servant and the best. One of the best things about him, though, he's a god fearing Notre Dame fan. He lives in South Bend, Indiana, and he has got a book out, which we put on our book page. You'll see it there. It's called Chasing Evil, Pursuing Dangerous Criminals, with the U.S. Marshals, and we're going to bring you his story about how he found. And so there was Jeff Nice, if you remember, he took down the snipers. Aaron Turner, we did a special embedded episode. He talked about some of the technical things behind the snipers. Now you're going to hear the story from the guy who actually, and he 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 had help, he did team, but this guy was the spear. He was the tip of the spear on this. This is the guy who actually found the snipers and discovered who they were. Uh, th- this is unbelievable. Um, I had met Bill previously in, our, in my career out of the Special Operations Division, but this is the man. This is the guy who put to rest all the rumors about who the suspects, everybody thought the suspects were. Uh, if you remember, and I'm not going to say too much because you're going to hear the story from Bill, but uh, if you remember the white box van, and it turned out to be so wrong. And this is a man that that really solved the case. It's a phenomenal. I, I'm just real proud to know him, that what he did there. He saved well, a lot of and, people. And the other thing you did too, Murph, tell him the real quick uh, surprise you got at your uh, Chicago event. Yeah, so on uh, Friday, March 4th, Javier and I, first public event speaking since before COVID, we were at the City Winery in Chicago for one show that night. 
And we had caught an Uber from our hotel next to the O'Hare airport. We pull up in front of the, the winery there and we're unloading boxes out of the back. Cause we take our books to the show and some other paraphernalia we offer for sale. Cause you know, when you retire from being a federal agent, you become a flea marketer. So as I'm unloading boxes, I turn around and the guy yells at me and I'm like, Billy, is that you? And it was Bill Sarukas. He had sent me a message and he said, and he signed it Billy S. And I wasn't realizing who Billy S. was in the, in the Uber as we're driving over. But he says, hey, I've got a ticket for the show tonight, but I'm working on a case. I'm not sure I'll be able to make it, but I'm going to drop a package off at the front desk for you and Javier. Billy comes walking up the street, perfect time. And he says, I can't believe you guys are here and hands us autographed and personalized copies of his book for Javier and I. What a freaking gentleman. He lives in Indiana and he's up in Chicago working on a missing person case. So, Billy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. I mean, what a wonderful surprise to start the evening for us that night. And if you want to surprise and hear the rest of the stories they said, I got to ask you one question, Murph. Are you ready? As we found out, too, somebody got the tagline wrong, <laughs> Jeremy Pendleton. So don't get it wrong, Jeremy. So let me ask you, Murph, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the original and unadulterated game of crimes ladies and gentlemen this is one like i've said before so many times get in sit down shut up and hold on let's find out the real story behind the dc snipers bring on billy sarukas All right, players, playerettes, we told you this is going to be an awesome episode because our guest is somebody I've known for a lot of years now. And then come to find out, not only is he a great guy, him and I have something in common. We both root for God's team, the University of Notre Dame. So, uh, welcome, former U.S. Marshal and head poobah of all things that matter, Bill Sarukas. Bill, welcome. Woohoo! Thank you, guys. Good to be with Glad you. Glad to have you on the show, Bill. Yeah, Bill, and, I was just thinking. What's you know, Bill, Bill and I met, I don't even remember the year, when, when I was at Special Operations Division. So uh, it's like bringing old friends back on the show here. Yeah, and a couple conferences and uh, and some other times, I'm sure, as well. Now, I, was, Bill, I wasn't in custody, was I? <laughs> well, no. I've seen okay. your mug photo, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did we ever meet down at America's Most Wanted? Because when John Clark did the thousandth episode, were you down there for that? Uh, the thousandth thousandth episode uh, show was done up in New York City, followed by a gathering up there. Um, it was done in Times Square. Well, the, the yeah, the the studio part was done, you know, in Washington, D.C. at the old studio. I think they did some of the recording and then we went up for Geraldo. But I was thinking John Clark was there with John Walsh and stuff. I don't remember if you were in the, the old studio there at AMW. Yeah, I've been to all the studios uh, since the late 90s. <laughs> Well, and the great thing about it, too, is we're going to talk about your book, too, Chasing Evil, which I think is a great headline for what we're going to talk about today. And John Walsh wrote the forward to the book, and I, I read that forward, and it's like, you know, the one thing I will tell you from my personal experience, uh, one of the great things always about working with the U.S. Marshals is it wasn't about the PR, it wasn't about the publicity or who got the headlines, it was about saddling up and let's go get it done. Let's go find the guy, let's go do the stuff. That's always been my experience with the Marshals. So I think it's great to have you on, Billy, uh, because for one thing, like I said, uh, you, you've done some great work over the years. But what is so interesting about what we got coming up is that we did an episode previously with Jeff Nice talking about the takedown of the DC sniper. Jeff was on the SWAT team with Montgomery County, worked with FBI HRT when they actually took them down. But a lot of that was based upon, as we find out now, and you guys will find out information, Billy, you worked on, you developed, you know, along with the rest of the team. And then we had Aaron Turner, Steve's friend, come up and talk about the technical part, which included the laptop, which was stolen from the first victim of the shooting mm -hmm. out in Maryland. Right. So this is a great thing because now this ties it all together. We've got the tactical SWAT version of it. We had the techie version of it. And now we got the operational, you know, an investigative piece of it with you. So this as, could, as, I'm just got sorry. I'm just getting excited. I'm going, this is going to be great. So as, as a, a former announcer used to say today, you get to hear the rest of the story, the rest of the story with Paul Harvey. So, <laughs> uh, but let's do this, Billy, as we do with everybody, you know, what we want to do is kind of give people an idea of your background of, how does a good God-fearing guy from Notre Dame... Yeah, by the way, here's one other quick point. When we're doing the pre-call, I used to live in Mishawaka next to the BK Club. And when I said that, you go, your parents held... What was it? Their uh, anniversary at the BK Club? 
Yes, in 1959, they, uh, that's where they had the reception. Wow, you guys <laughs> went to the Burger King Club, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> big timers. What, what was that? Was that like more like a, just a social club? I can't remember if it was like an American Legion outpost, too, or uh, if it was just like a social club. I believe it was a, a Belgian-related social club uh, that had an upstairs bar and a downstairs that they used for um, parties Events and things and like yeah. that. Yeah. That may have been where I got my fondness for Belgian beer. Who knows? Maybe I snuck a couple of beers when I was a youth. So, <laughs> hey, but but let's do this, Billy. Let's talk about, um, you know, how did you get into law enforcement? Because, you know, in, in the federal side, the U.S. Marshals is the oldest law enforcement agency in the United States, right? The oldest federal law federal enforcement, law enforcement agency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's probably when Murph was around. I think Murph applied for the original position, but uh, well, he got I, they wouldn't down. give me a they wouldn't give me a free shirt, so I said, "Screw you guys." I'm or a go. horse. They wouldn't give you a horse either. So, <laughs> so let's talk about that, Billy. Let's talk about how how did you get into the marshals? What led you to finally saying, "Hey, look, I think this is the life for me." Well, I, I probably didn't take the traditional route into law enforcement that most people take. Uh, after graduating from Indiana State University with a bachelor of science degree in criminology, um, I went back to high school. Um, <laughs> so did little, Murph. That's a little Fifth grade backwards. was the hardest three years of Murph's life. So uh, <laughs> It was third grade, thank third you. Third grade, okay, third grade. <laughs> so, hey, wait a minute, that's interesting too because we talked about that. So you graduate, you think you're done with school, and it's like, no, you're not done with school. We're sending you back to high school. How did that happen? Yeah, actually, uh, the day that I graduated from college, I, I stopped in Indianapolis and took the Secret Service exam. Uh, which was high on my list of uh, the agencies that I was uh, looking at. But within a couple of days of returning uh, home, my father, who was an Indiana State trooper, made an offer to me to meet a couple of detectives. I had no idea what the meeting was about. It was in uh, uh, LaPorte County at a, a place outside, you know, nowhere in the county and at a little restaurant. And these two detectives from LaPorte... Uh, Jeff Welliver and Gene Samuelson made an offer uh, for me to become a high school student again at, at LaPorte High School. So within a few days, I was in Indianapolis uh, obtaining my f fake ID, uh, my undercover ID, and all of the information that I would need to enter high school. And it was kind of a unique experience because they had previously had an operative in the high school, but he had been discovered um, and probably leaked out through the administration. So on this occasion, I was going in by myself. They were not going to notify the administration or anyone in the school uh, about who I was or what I was doing. There were about 25 or 30 transfers into the school at that time. Um, that made me feel a little bit comfortable, but still um, being my first assignment, not knowing what to expect and uh, having a history in government class again, um, I didn't know what to expect <laughs> when I walked in that first day. The other thing, too, is folks can't see us because, you know, we can see the video and I've known Bill for years. You kind of got that red hair, but you've got that youthful look. So even though you graduated college, you could still pull off being what, a junior in high school? I, I was a junior in high school uh, in 1984. So, uh, I mean, did or you? Have, I'm sorry, 1983. Did you have a steady girlfriend or anything, or were what you was going on there? You know, I, I got a pretty good education very, very quickly from the prosecutors about what I could and couldn't do. <laughs> I and, bet you uh, did. <laughs> aff affiliating with uh, people that were under the age of 18 was one of those items that they. Well, uh, we're sure to uh, discuss with me <laughs> that. And let's talk about the booze, too, because you could drink legally, but you couldn't provide booze to anybody else because that would be contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Yeah, I, I couldn't go into um, a, a liquor store and buy anything for them. I couldn't go to a party and, and pour it out of a tap into a cup of a minor. I couldn't hand them a cup. Um, it, it was difficult because uh, you have to get out into those environments. Um, to make yourself available to purchase uh, the narcotics that the that the uh, detectives wanted me to. This sounds like something from Mission Impossible. Should you be caught or killed, the agency will disavow any knowledge <laughs> of your existence. It's like it you were really on your own in there, right? Well, when you think about 1983, um, I had no access to a cell phone or um, – Pay phones were, you know, maybe in one part of the school. So if I had some trouble, I had to stop at a pay phone or get out of the school somehow, fake an illness or or do something to 
to get myself out of that situation. Um, I, it wasn't working undercover. wasn't something that I was adept to at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what kind of what kind of drugs were they having you go after? What was the, what was the problem in the high school that they sent you in to work on? You know, I think that the detectives had an idea that primarily it was uh, blotter acid, marijuana, a little bit of um, um, speed. Um, but I think they also wanted me to kind of figure out what and where the problem was. Um, they had very little information. It was a problem back then in the school, but they wanted me to tell them where the problem was. And, and you know, marijuana, uh, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's in a, even though it's a schedule one drug, you know, um, that's in a different category. But when I start thinking blotter acid back then, I'm start thinking marijuana might, you know, it's going to have a different effect, but I'm thinking of these kids. I mean, did you ever see any of the kids that it, when they ended up taking the acid, you know, or any of the after effects, did you ever see anybody uh, from the effects of the acid that was being sold in the school? I, I can't recall seeing anything that that stuck out to me at that time. I, I didn't know what the effects were going in um, until one day when I experienced it, when I when I bought um, several pieces of blotter acid at a local restaurant from from a kid. Um, I had gotten the the substance on my fingers and licked the envelope that I put them in. And the rest of that day um <laughs> what was blurry, blurry to me, <laughs> and we we were not able to make a case on that particular purchase. Well, and I wonder if you're using their evidence. I mean, how, what are you going to present in court? Come yeah. on, Bill. Officer Sarukas, <laughs> did you or did you not, not consume the evidence from my client? Oh, man. Well, man I, I, have you had any flashbacks? I still had... You... I still had the, the, the envelope and the pieces of paper when I met with the detectives to turn it over to them, but getting that stuff on your hands and your mouth, and uh, oh. it was to the point I, I couldn't remember the times and where I was or the, you know, immediately. I, after a while, I was able to recall all of that information, but immediately when I, when I got home to make some notes, yeah. um, did they it rec- just wasn't there. Did they recognize that something was wrong with you? I didn't meet with the detectives that day. Oh, okay. um, I, yeah, Billy I, was I drove, lost in the woods. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Chasing the unicorns. I drove home and, and really don't remember driving. Wow. wow. You have, know, you had, have you had any residual effects from that all these years later? Well, I would say no, but other people may say <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, but, you know, we kind of joke about it, but, you know, there's a real danger, too, that we started oh, yeah. finding out. We didn't know at that time. We didn't know what we knew. We didn't know too much about needles. I ended up getting stuck with a needle. I got really sick. They thought it was like hepatitis C. I'm searching the car, you know, got a needle in my finger. We didn't know those things back then. I mean, we know a lot more now. And so I think about that now and I'm thinking, you got a little bit of acid on your finger, but that same amount of it was fentanyl now, that that kills people. We've had officers, oh, yeah. you know, in serious, and now you got to wear PPE gear, you know, and gloves and everything when you're handling this stuff. I mean, we've come a long way since then. I mean, it's fortunate that it was just, you know, a small amount, but man, ugh. Sorry. You no, know, you get you getting stuck by a needle and and having a negative reaction explains a lot about you today, Morgan. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, it wasn't so fun when I walked into the doctor's office and said I'm not feeling good, and then I passed out in the doctor's office, and five days later they let me out of the hospital. Damn. Wow. That was no fun. Uh, but I, I don't know. Maybe if I'd been on acid, it would have been a fun, <laughs> more fun trip. What was that? Ooh, Timothy, Timothy Leary said, "Tune in." <laughs> uh, Tune in, you know, something and drop out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Tune in, turn on, and drop out. But anyway, back go. to our regularly scheduled podcast with you, Billy. So you're working this stuff. How long are you in Laporte, uh, you know, working as an off? Or, now, were you a uh, were you a police officer or were you a fully sworn police officer or were you doing, like, contract work like a confidential informant? I, I was sworn in as a special deputy by the Laporte County Sheriff at that time. Um, so it wasn't an informant type of thing. I was, I was sworn to enforce the law and go into the school and, and uncover, uh, anything illegal. And at one point during my time there, one of the students in the school introduced me to a, uh, an individual outside the school who was selling, uh, Percocet. He was selling individual tablets. He had his own, uh, um, prescription pad that he would write and for for whatever I needed and sell Percocets for a dollar a piece. And but it led into some other stuff where when I went to his house one day, he had a pair of 
um, Air Jordan shoes, as I remember, some some version of the Air Jordan shoes. And so I, I bought the shoes. I could tell that they were stolen. <laughs> so <laughs> how much did you have to pay? Those were like those were the ultimate thing to get mm-hmm. back then. Yeah. yeah, I think I paid seventy five dollars for them. But when I got when I got back to process them for you know, to put them into evidence, they were two left shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen out of a department store somewhere, you know, where they just put the display yes. shoes, yeah? yeah exactly. They, he had taken them from a display where they only put the one shoe up on the rack. <laughs> um, so, you know, the detectives told me that I had to go back and have a little meeting with this individual and assert my uh, disappointment in how, what he did with me. But I don't think that he knew it either. And he, he had boxes in there of stereo systems in his house. Uh, I believe they were all stolen from a Kmart store in LaPorte, Indiana. Wow. Dang, man, you're getting involved. Oh so how long, did your, uh, how long did your association with the LaPorte County Sheriff's Office last? It lasted and for five months until I got arrested in May of that year. <laughs> Undercover. Well, did, yes, did I got well, for doing acid. Gotta, apparently, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was taken into custody with all the other students at that particular time when they rolled the bus up and uh, came into the school and arrested everybody. How many arrests were there? I believe uh, in my school there were about fifty total, um, and throughout the county there were a couple of hundred because wow. there were operatives in two other schools. Wow. Now, what was the impact? I'm, you know, the school kind of, it sounds like they uh, uh, unmasked, you know, the first operative. How did they react when you r- r- walk up there with the bus and you're, ta- I mean, you're arresting 50 students? How did the school react and how did the community react when that happened? Um, the, the school, the administration w- was supportive and, and they asked me to write a letter to the students telling them, you know, this is the name you knew, be, knew me by. You knew me as uh, Scott Miller, uh, but that's not my real name. You know, I was working here. I was trying to help you. So the administration was all for it. Um, the students were, were upset, obviously, the, especially those that were arrested. Um, <laughs> That's the way it normally is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think that the good students in the school appreciated it. So th- there was a mix of uh, emotion during that time. Well, didn't you have a uh, an incident with, with some of the deputies? Because, you know, I mean... I was just getting to that, man. You were too good of a student. What, what happened there, Billy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very early on in my time there... Um, I, I had a government class, and I had a test coming up, and so I went back to a, a facility where all of the different undercover people went to to do reports and things and meet with prosecutors. And during that time, I was sitting down at, at a table and reading and studying for my test the next day, and a, a sheriff's deputy um who was a, a very big guy that they nicknamed Roadblock? He <laughs> came right. in and asked me. Came in and asked me what I was doing, and I said, well, I, "I have a test tomorrow." And I had a, a few of my other books sitting off to the side, and he said, "Oh, okay. Well, let me take a look at that." He took my book and the other ones and walked outside to a, a barrel that was on fire <laughs> and threw my books into it. <laughs> and he said, listen, you're you're taking the identity of a, of a C student here. You can't start Don't getting get an A's. <laughs> <laughs> you're taking that very serious. So my next problem was calculating on the test, you know, am I at a 70 or 72? Because <laughs> I, I knew most of the answers, so I was calculating where my score was going to be. Well, that's because you were a college graduate. You you got the degree. Now you're back. That's hilarious. Who wants, yeah, who wants to take government twice? So when you got done with the sheriff's office, or with that thing, how much longer did you stay on the sheriff's office before you moved on? Um, it, it was It was a seamless transition to the state of Indiana at that time, and it was during that time when I was working with the state of Indiana that I met a few deputy marshals through a case that I was working, and they suggested that um, I consider coming over to the marshal service. I didn't know much about the agency uh, at the time. What was the agency you were working with in Indiana before, before that you said you went to the state of Indiana? What agency was that? I was with the Indiana State Excise Police, which is and it, it enforces alcoholic beverage laws, gambling laws, prostitution. Um, I traveled throughout the state because of my undercover experience. 
uh, to different college towns working undercover things, whatever it may have been, prostitution, gambling. Did you have to be a C student at those colleges too? No, I, I was never enrolled at another college. <laughs> you were done with school at that point, right? I was done, yes. I was finished. That's a very unique story. Graduate college and go back to high school. I like it. First of all, here you got a guy who's a cop that does acid, goes back to school, wants to get an A, and they say, no, you need to be a C student. I mean, which parent tells his kids, I want you to be a good C student? Roadblock does. Roadblock does, yeah. Hey, so uh, so how long were you then on the excise board, the state of Indiana? You said you started talking to these marshals. What intrigued you about that versus the Secret Service? You know, I actually went for an interview at the Secret Service during the time that I was working undercover at the high school. And I am sure that my appearance at that time, because I couldn't change it, um, I, I probably was discounted as a candidate the minute I walked in the door. Um, had a little bit long hair, an army jacket that, that smelled pretty bad and, um, you know, like smoke and cigarettes and maybe a little marijuana in there. I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, they did their due diligence as far as an interview, but uh, immediately shred the paperwork the minute I was walking out the door. <laughs> no, they, didn't, they didn't want any acid addicts in their ranks, you know? <laughs> no. I don't know. Hey, if you look at those, those guys, they are spit shine. You know, they're, they got their haircut and they're looking good. Yeah, but good. you know, but the other thing Great though too shape. is, it's like, but you, the thing is you got to appreciate the fact you're working undercover. You cannot cut your hair, get in a suit, come in and then grow your hair back overnight, you know, to go back doing your undercover stuff. But right. Hey, now, did you have to disclose? I'm not. I'm not trying to be facetious, but seriously, because of the acid, did that? Did you have to disclose that on any of your uh, uh, security forms? That you know, I, this is what happened to me. I take it. You know, did you have to disclose that kind of accidental drug use? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Did that cost? I did at all at, at all levels. No, I don't think it cost me anything because I explained the situation. Yeah. Uh, that I was in, and uh, and I, I was around kids all the time at the school who were smoking, smoking marijuana. I always had to come up with an excuse or they, they tried to teach me how to simulate smoking, you know, how to position myself in a particular part of the car um, or simulate that I was smoking it. I, I probably wasn't very good at it, but I, but I never did that. I'm aware of in, in, inhale any of that. Well, you and Bill Clinton, I didn't. I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or uh. Gil Gordon, the guys in California. I held my breath for the picture. All of these great excuses. So, um, so again, but it goes back, what intrigued you about the Marshalls then? Like you, you're talking to these guys, what, what made you go, yeah, let's do this. Well, I, I, after they initially approached me, I went down to their office uh, a couple of times and um, just met with them, and, and they educated me about the agency. I mean, I, at that time, I knew about the FBI. I knew about DEA and ATF and and the Secret Service, but I, but I didn't know about the Marshal Service. So um, they showed me a brochure, and it had uh, like a, a red Corvette on it, and, and I assumed that all new deputies were going to be getting a red Corvette, <laughs> uh, but it was actually it was actually showing um, that the agency seized assets yeah. uh, uh, on behalf of the Department of Justice, and that was one of the assets that had been seized during a, a drug investigation. <laughs> so um, I would probably be getting a Dodge Diplomat instead. Yeah. Dude, I know the feeling. Uh, as a police officer, I think we were driving. At that line of PD back in 1982, when I first started there, like 79, you know, Mercury's, you know, and then my first state patrol car was a 1984 Plymouth Grand Fury with yeah. a 318 in it. I mean, that those things were, those were a joke. When I, when I first started with the state, they gave me a Ford LTD that has a, a, a front on it that's, I don't know, about 35 or 40 feet long with a two foot <laughs> trunk on the back. <laughs> And they told me just to go driving around the area and, you know, get familiar with the roads and how everything works. And I, I went over to the Gary, Indiana area. And as I'm driving up Broadway, uh, people are waving at me. And I, I couldn't figure out why until I got to the police department and every car in their lot, whether it was marked or unmarked, was a Ford LTD. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the Crown Vicks. 
Those things, and man, yeah, you had to start turning five minutes before you got to the corner that felt mm-hmm. like those. And then if you were shorter, it was very difficult to look over the hood. We actually had a couple officers kind of had to not sit on books, but they brought in some things to kind of elevate themselves up because seeing <laughs> over the front of that hood and where the curb was and everything was was a challenge for sh- vertically challenged people. Yeah, yeah, going 80 miles an hour in one of those was like taking off from an airport in a Cessna, <laughs> looking over the... The, the front of the plane. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Just I, I just hope I don't run out of runway. So uh so when did you get on the when when did you get on the marshal service? I started um I, I had been with when I was with the state I was working at the Indian Indianapolis five hundred time trials. And when I got back from uh one of those weekends I had an offer letter from the marshal service. So I had a couple of weeks to decide and, and I was sworn in uh, the day after Memorial Day in 1986 um, at the local office. And two days later, I was in my car and headed to Glencoe, Georgia for the training academy. Wow. Dang. So everybody else we talked to that you know, became feds, it's a year process, two-year process, longer, hiring freezes. How long did your process take? I believe it was uh, about three months. <laughs> I, I first met the deputies in February of that year. And and receive and did the interview and and everything, um, with within the next couple of months. Um, That's great. And when I, when I went for the interview, the interview was about two minutes long. <laughs> what did they do? Just check your heartbeat and make sure you you Bill Sarukas. Let's get your fingerprints. See you later. The guy that the guy that came and got me at the front of the courthouse. His name was Frank Kolach. He was the acting chief deputy at the time. And I, I said, I had met him before. I said, you know, any advice going into the interview? He said, don't act like John Wayne in here. <laughs> he said, just, just be yourself. They're going to have a couple of questions. Just, just be yourself and everything's going to be fine. And, um, I was there for maybe five minutes. Wow. <laughs> wow. And they just told me to wait and, um, you know, I'd get the letter. And, and so it was, uh, right around three months. Wow. And so, actually, your your academy was longer than the time yeah. it took you to apply. <laughs> so uh, you so, got you got to Glencoe, Georgia, in what month? I got there in at the end of May in 1986. So it was a little bit warm, wasn't it? Ooh, and humid. <laughs> yeah, and the sand fleas oh, and yeah. uh, and all of that. Yeah. Whew. What 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 was the best part you liked about the academy? The end. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I was, I w- I was ready to go to work. Um, you know, I, I had been through an Indiana Academy for even a longer period of time. I think the Indiana Academy was twenty weeks. Um, so I was ready to go to work. I I had become familiar with the agency. I was ready to go, and my first duty station was San Diego. Not bad. Well, that's yeah. I mean, how did you score San Diego? What, what was what was going on in San Diego? Uh, what was the main bulk of the work that uh, the marshals were doing in San Diego? Um, well, it, it's one of the offices in the country out of maybe 15 or 20 offices that really see every part of the marshal service, uh, whether it's working the border for fugitives, seizing assets for DEA, the FBI, and all the other uh, Department of Justice components, uh, witness security program, and, uh, transporting prisoners, or of course the uh, the main mission of the agency for which it was founded for uh, protecting the judiciary. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was all there, and there there are enough variables in the marshal service for anybody. Somebody anybody can find something that they prefer in the agency and what direction they want to go. So when you were in San Diego, what did you start gravitating towards? What, what areas piqued your interest? Well, I, I, I almost didn't make it to San Diego because... Were you on acid during, again? You get lost? No, no. <laughs> while, while I was at the training academy, uh, I was approached by one of my... Uh, a student in another class, and he was from the Los Angeles area and being sent to Indianapolis. So he approached me about switching. And so our class coordinator got the two chief deputies on the phone from San Diego and Indianapolis and said, hey, you know, these guys are considering switching. So one of one of the voices on the phone, and I didn't know it at the time, 
was the chief from San Diego, and he said, hey, do either of you play baseball or softball? And so I spoke up and said, yeah, I played baseball in high school and a little bit afterwards in an amateur league. And, and they had a baseball team, didn't they? Yes, they did. They had a softball, softball team. team. <laughs> <laughs> and what position did you end up playing on that softball team when you went to San Diego? I, I played shortstop mainly. <laughs> there, you um, go. there you go. The but needs at, of the at, service. I need a shortstop. That's right. At the end of the conversation, um, the, the counselor said, well, Bob, what do you want to do out there in San Diego? And he said, well, I don't know which one said they want, they're, they've they played baseball before, but I want that one. So I really don't care what his name is. I want that one. So I uh, I finished up the academy on the Friday before Labor Day, drove home to Indiana, spent one day, and started out toward San Diego where I had to report the, the day after Labor Day. Wow. So oh. needless to say, you were single at that time, right? I've been single the whole time. Okay. Yeah. So uh, how long of a drive was it from uh, Indiana to San Diego? <sighs> I think it took me two and a half days to get there. I, I, I had, my, I had a, a brand new 1986 Mustang. Woo-hoo. And as I, as, I, as I drove from Phoenix into San Diego along the, the international <laughs> border, I had I had my arm out the window cruising along through the mountains, and when I pulled into San Diego, I couldn't bend my elbow because it was so sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else got sunburned, didn't they, Murph? What did you do yesterday? Fell asleep on the beach? Yeah, I fell asleep on the beach. My noggin here is a little bit red today. I think. Yeah, he looks like Rudolph the Redhead Reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking good. <laughs> yeah, until you know, it starts peeling. It really sets off the white hair, doesn't it? Yeah, the hair, singular. Um, <laughs> hey, so, I've got 28 now. I've got a number. <laughs> it almost matches your IQ. You're getting close. Hey, there you um, go. So you, your left arm is sunburned for quite a while. So you get to San Diego. So, hey, so what we want to do is you got to work. And in fact, if, if people go get your book, they can find it obviously on Amazon, some other places. It's called Chasing Evil, uh, Pursuing Dangerous Criminals with U.S. Marshals. When did that book come out, Billy? How long? That was just like a month and a half ago month ago? No, it was, it was published in uh, July of last year. Oh, okay. Mm. I just saw you doing a bunch of book signings. So you kind of been doing some additional launches and stuff, right? Yes. Cool. Well, the book has been out. So and it, don't worry, folks, it'll be on our book page too. So it's called Chasing Evil, Pursuing Dangerous Criminals with U.S. Marshals. You know, you and I have talked before too about this. You worked a lot of stuff. I mean, and in the book you talk about, um, I, I mean, just some of the biggest cases, in fact, before we get into talking about the DC sniper, just give us kind of a brief overview of some of the cases you cover in the book. Well, it, and like I said, your your ultimate destination and what you do in the marshal service is usually determined early on in your career by somewhat what you want to do, somewhat by the demands of your office that you're in. Um, so, uh, you know, a person that may be introduced to the witness security program, they may find that as a career long position that they enjoy. Um, in night in 1987, the fall of 1987, our chief deputy in the office, um, formulated a, an ad hoc task force for a guy named Thomas Hercules Pepinos. Tom was kind of an inventor and entrepreneur in the methamphetamine production business. And he was a, a member of a local motorcycle club that was, affiliated with the Hells Angels there. So he was indicted in the early 1980s, and in 1986, his case was still pending, and he had been placed on the Marshal Service 15 Most Wanted list. So our chief formed this this small little task force because he... He didn't. He didn't want this guy out there anymore. You know, when he would go to chiefs conferences, he would, uh, you know, get an earful from the other chiefs about why he still has a guy on the most wanted list. So we started working it, and during that particular time, I to this day I don't know why, but there was a name within the existing file that um, it was a P- Thomas Peter Dussel. And nobody that I was working with understood where it came from or how it got into the file. So I took it and ran with it. And I came up with a California driver's license uh, that had recently been issued in that name. And when I brought it into the office, um, everybody looked at it and, and we thought that the face 
was, was certainly something similar to who we were looking for. But in California, there is a right thumbprint on driver's licenses. On this particular license, the one of the guys that I was working with said that print doesn't match. I, th- I thought it was still the guy. So I went over to our local FBI office and asked a guy to teach me how to read fingerprints. I said, <laughs> I, I, got, I, I, I think this is him. I got to figure this out, right? I didn't tell the FBI guy that, but I just said, teach me how to read fingerprints. Well, he gave me a book. And over the next couple of weeks, I taught myself you know the the it's called the Henry read a class- fingerprint. was called the Henry classification back then no it was a, it had evolved to the NCIC classification the class- yeah. at that point yeah so whorls and loops and deltas and now cuz i think to get a confirmation of a print you have to match 10 points right on the print or not really close- there there really isn't any um number of points that you need it's more the relationship of those characteristics that can identify a print one to the other. Um, you may you may have a very partial print, but you could still identify it uh, with with several points because it's and again it's because of the relationship of that minutia to one another. So, I was going to tell you the way we I, used to do it: just take the take a fingerprint, get a known fingerprint. We just used to blow it up on the copier and just put you know put it up for the light. That was the poor man's way of saying, "Is this the same guy?" Overlap them, and it's like, "Yep, same same print." Hey, Bill, you got well, to exact... remember he was a cop in Kansas, so that explains a yeah, lot. We didn't right? have all the fancy equipment back then, man. <laughs> we had party line internet. That's how bad it was. Oh, boy. <laughs> Blowing it up is exactly what I did. Um, <laughs> See? See, Steve? Nana, nana. <laughs> I did. I still have it today. Um, I blew it up, and I put a piece of black tape down the middle of it to connect the two of them and and worked on identifying those points. But what I found was... And I, and I took it back to, you know, the guys that I was working with. And the one guy continued to say it wasn't him. He said, the print doesn't match. He said, you're, you're, you're putting it upside down. And I said, I don't care which way you put it, upside down or sideways, it still matches. He, and what happened was Pepinos turned his thumb 180 degrees when he supplied the print. So it didn't look the way it should, but the deltas are still in the, the, the place they should be with a fingerprint. So um, once I figured that out, we knew it was him, and he was arrested within a, a month or two after that in Bullhead City, Arizona. Yeah, I think there's some other stuff that went on in Bullhead City, Steve, oh, yeah. I think, like with Jay Dobbins and some <laughs> other folks, uh, ATF guys working that. Hey, yeah. um, did you ever figure out where that slip or you know where that name came from? Did, did you ever figure out how they developed that name? No, I, I actually um, traveled over to Arizona once he was removed from that district over to San Diego and brought him back on a um, Coast Guard aircraft with a few other deputies. Um, there, his wife, who was with him, was also part of the indictment, as was a third person that, that uh, was nearby, and we arrested him as well. So three people from that indictment were all arrested. And I brought him back to San Diego, and I actually became quite familiar with he and his family over the years. Um, he was kind of a legendary figure in uh, the El Cajon area of San Diego. Yeah, I bet you, um, I bet you in the good graces of the uh, marshal now, weren't you? Uh, not so much the marshal, but the chief. Yeah. Um, the the marshal had been around for, for many years at that point. His name was uh, Bob LaFoon. He had been appointed in 1966. Uh, so this is wow. 21 years later. Uh, he was a he was a legendary San Diego law enforcement uh, officer over the years, and um, he had a different way of thinking. Um, he wore the same suit every day. I think. Uh, <laughs> this but he like was a, <laughs> yeah. He he was a, he was a great guy. He, I mean, he had a different way of of sending his message to you. Um, I remember one time he walked past my desk and he said, 42 degrees, and he just kept walking. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, as he came back, he said, did you hear me? I said, 42 degrees. I said, yeah, I, I heard you, but I don't know what, what you mean. He said, that's the temperature in Terre Haute, Indiana today, because <laughs> he knew I was from Indiana. <laughs> and it's kind of like one of the things, you should be happy you're here in San Diego, oh, right? Yeah. Where it was probably 80, yeah. 82 degrees, right? Constantly. Yeah. All right. Well, um, 
So that kind of set you then, like you said, that was kind of, you started becoming really good at the fugitive piece of it, right? And, and thinking differently. And that's kind of what leads in then into the uh, sniper case. Before we get in there, just give us the chap, some of the, some of the cases you cover in your book too. Okay. Yeah. For, after that case, I think my, you know, where I was going to be in the agency kind of, uh, you know, led into that area into investigations. That's where I was going to be the rest of my career as far as the chief in San Diego was concerned. And I think that's where I was comfortable as well. So a, a few of the things that happened between uh, that 1987 arrest and, you know, when I uh, ultimately got to headquarters and worked that particular case was I became a member of the agency special operations group, which is uh, the marshal's version of a tactical team. It's uh, it's based in Pineville, Louisiana, and I had to go down there for a month of training, um, paramilitary type training. Um, so during that time, I became a member of that group, and that led me out to going out on some different types of missions um, following hurricane um, uh, hurricanes in the in the Gulf area, uh, St. Croix. There was a huge hurricane in, I believe, 1989. Um, and so we went down there and restored order because all the police officers left. Well, that, um, uh, I think it was they, Hurricane Hugo, wasn't it? It was Hugo, yes. Yeah. And we, we, the Marshal Service has kind of become the agency to respond to, to, to hurricanes and disasters afterwards for a couple of reasons. One... Uh, the agency can deputize people uh, to enforce federal law and give them the the authority that they need. The second is after Hurricane um, Katrina, the agency and, and Congress passed a law called the uh, uh, Adam Walsh Child Protection Act. And in that, it allows for the Marshal Service now to be the agency responsible for the reunification of children that are displaced during those times of disasters like that. So we work with FEMA and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and try to reunite and do the best we can to get those families back together again, because it is kind of chaos when everything is happening. So... Um, Special Operations Group in the late 90s, uh, I was at Ruby Ridge uh, when when that incident began in August of 1992 as part of the Special Operations Group. Uh, in late 1995, I became a supervisor in the office in San Diego, briefly handling some, some court assignment things and prisoner transportation things before I moved over to become the coordinator uh, of the uh, fugitive group of the San Diego Task Force. Uh, it was run by the U.S. attorney there under an anti-crime initiative of the Attorney General Janet Reno at the time. So we had about 50 investigators from maybe 10 agencies in the San Diego area that were all part of this task force. And I did that for three years until um, I, I became a uh, senior inspector at Marshall Service headquarters and assigned to domestic investigations. So I did that for a couple of years. I get involved with um, a couple of cases during that time. Um, when I was the coordinator for the task force, one of the major cases that we worked was the uh, the investigation for Andrew Cunanan. Uh, By the way, I got a tie. I got a tie into that. Um, so his first homicide that he committed was in East Rush Lake up in Minnesota. Um, my, we're, we're up, my, my sister and brother-in-law live up there. They, their parents, their, their family has a cabin up there. We went up there. We went by the spot where he committed his first homicide up there. And I'm going, I mean, it, it was weird because you think about all the other stuff, but I was looking for the X on the water going, Hey, this is, you know, this word happened, no X on the water. But I mean, that, that was my little tie in when I was reading that. It's like, I've been to that exact spot, and it's amazing. He starts in Minnesota, you know, works obviously all his way down. To, I think it was Florida, right? Well, works his way. He kills uh, Lee Miglin in Chicago. He kills a man in New Jersey, and then he ends up killing Gianni Versace in, in Florida. Yeah. Mm. Wow. But you also got involved in the Texas 7, too. Yeah, that, that happens after I get back to headquarters, as, as well as the railway killer, Rafael Resendez Ramirez, a— uh, um, he was the serial killer, right? About 30, did they think, or so? 
You know, the the number has varied anywhere from about 15 to 17 up to about 28 or 30 over the years. Uh, I don't think he was totally candid at the end in, in describing all those, or maybe he couldn't remember all of them. Um, he was involved in cases from Florida to Washington State, um, up into Michigan, um, but primarily along the southwest border because he was riding the rails, going from place to place, finding his victims in, in homes that were nearby the railroad tracks. Mm-mm-mm. Man, and that and that it's so complicated too because now you've got somebody basically with has no permanent address, no location. They just ride the rails. They go state to state. The crossing of jurisdictional boundaries creates problems because until you can link the cases together, you think you're working just a homicide. You know, just I've got a homicide in my jurisdiction, right? You got to start linking these things together. Um, but anyway, but that too, and then um, did what did that case come before the Texas Seven or after? The Texas Seven was, I believe, in November of two of two thousand two thousand one. The Railway Killer was before that. That was in ninety nine, I believe, ninety nine or two thousand. And those kind of people, they don't carry cell devices or electronic devices that you can exploit. I mean, it's hard to find those people. They they didn't back then. I mean, most of your drug dealers that the the Marshal Service pursues, they have to have communication with their their clients. And um, so in some ways they make it easy on us until they figure out ways to get around it. And then, then you once figure we out catch ways up, to get around the ways they got around. And then we're back to this yeah. cat and mouse game. Yeah. Hence we came up with game of crimes, game of crimes. It's the Sorry, big game. I had to get a cheesy commercial yeah. in there. Well, but, 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 but the Texas seven happens uh, December, I think of 2000, because that's right before, 9-11, and then obviously a year after 9-11 is when the whole D.C. sniper starts, too. So, Because um, the other thing, too, is things like all of these cases in your book, too, if people go, look, these things are not only documented. Some of these have been turned into miniseries or some of them, you know, are, have got other stories around them, especially America's Most Wanted was really good, especially on the Texas 7 they killed. I think it was uh, Aubrey Hawkins was the police officer who was killed by these guys. Um, and it just... You know, it's just, Billy, it's amazing when I've started reading the book and going through the chapters, the the things you got involved with that have such historical significance, mm-hmm. not just a, a case here or there, but I mean, you're working across all of these different things, which kind of leads us up to, um, like I said, the, the sniper, folks can go get the book. Like I say, it's on Amazon. It's on our book uh, uh, page, you know, Chasing Evil. But but the the real you know some of the evil people you come across so many evil people and Malvo and Muhammad were obviously this you know this a a, a different kind of evil but they were evil. Let's kind of start getting into that now about how did you get involved with the sniper case because um, I was living in Loudoun County at the time. I remember uh, we'll talk to because some of the other homicides happened earlier. But the things that people come to refer to them as is the Beltway snipers. The collection of homicides started happening, you know, out here in the Virginia, Maryland, D.C. region. Um, but how did you end up getting involved with that? Because they bought the car actually on September 11th, 2002, and then events happened from there. So let's let's talk about that. What were you doing at the time? Where were you working uh, as you got involved in this? I was assigned at that time to our technical operations group um, that's involved in, you know, the tracking of uh, communications and vehicles and Uh, All the technical things, video surveillance, uh, all the things that you would assume is connected with technical um, types of things related to an investigation. So on uh, that Thursday in Montgomery County when the four homicides happened, and then there was one the previous evening too, so and and one in Washington, D.C., so they basically had six homicides in a small area over the course of about 20 hours, I believe, that took place. Uh, but the four that occurred on that Thursday morning had the attention of everybody in the region. It, it, news has a way of magnifying in the capital area when it happens, things like that. So we were well aware of it. Um Our fugitive task force based in Washington, D.C., had worked with Montgomery County. Uh, So on Friday morning, we were contacted by a a commander, and he asked if we would uh, come up to Montgomery County for a briefing about what 
had happened the day before to see. He was just uh, hoping that in some way we might be able to contribute something to the investigation because they really had nothing at that point. They're pulling at straws. Did you ever uh, run into Mitch Cunningham up at Montgomery County? I I know who he is, but um, I didn't I didn't work with him on this case. I don't believe he was doing some of the negotiation stuff. But go ahead, Steve. Now, let me say here that for our listeners, that when incidents like this happen uh, and and what Billy's telling us here now is they had to be invited uh, just because they're federal agents and you just don't unless you're the FBI, you just don't go in and steal everybody else's case. But. Now, Every Steve, long... Steve. <laughs> oh, I love, I love your story in the book. You got, you folks got to read this because you'll get a real good feeling for how, what I'm talking about when we talk about the Bureau, because you put it right out there. I appreciate that, Billy. But uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that when things like this are happening, every police officer and even not to just the immediate geographical area, but in the surrounding areas wants to get involved because they're that dedicated to protecting the public. So I'm sure when you when you guys got that call, Billy, you guys are thinking about damn time. Let's go. I'm sure you were ready to run out the door. I, and no joke. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're right. You know, there's always that waiting for that phone call to come on those cases. I mean, even though you have 150 cases that you're already working, you you want to be involved in in that one that's taking place at that moment. Well, you know, out at, and you're familiar with Special Operations Division. We're out there. And uh, and we're trying to figure out how we can, as headquarters humps, can get involved in this investigation. <laughs> I mean, even setting up roadblocks, looking for that that ghost white van that everybody was looking for. Yeah, and I believe there were DE agents up in Montgomery County at one point. Yeah, I'm sure there um, were. Yeah, I mean, they were helping in some way, in some fashion. Uh, I don't recall exactly what, but um, I'm sure that they were there. Um, so we we get the phone call. We go up to their their office up in Rockville. And they give us uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half briefing about the the previous day's events. And the commander just looked at us and said, okay, what are we going to do? And we said, there were three of us there. We said, well, you know, we're going to take everything that we've got and go back and have a have a sit down with ourselves and some other people and, and try to figure out how we can help you. So we discussed a lot in the car on the way back to our facility. and. We were we were kind of ready to go with some technical stuff that that we had as far as what we could do with some cell phones and seeing what was in the area, what was not in the area, and and matching up some things. It was a pretty small area in in Montgomery County where these things took place. So, you know, finding two devices that maybe in different cell sites wasn't really one of the options at that time. Um, But that quickly changed at about 2.30 that afternoon when we got word that another shooting had happened in Fredericksburg. A woman in a parking lot down there had been shot uh, through and through round, shot with a a high-powered rifle, believed to be, and she ended up surviving. So uh, within a day or two, it was determined that that was involved in the case, and now we had a little bit more to go on. So working through our headquarters, um, we were bringing people in from fugitive task forces in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, We were bringing people in uh, to supplement our technical operations. Uh, This thing was growing by the day. And although nothing happened over the weekend uh, after the shooting in Fredericksburg, there there was a couple of days where you kind of took a little sigh of relief. Early Monday morning, everything changed, and, and in my opinion, the, the case elevated when the uh, student was shot at uh, Benjamin Tasker Middle School. And we're talking about a 14-year-old here. Yes. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was shot as he was uh, getting out of his uh, one of his relatives' cars. And... and Billy, I want to interject. You made a good point in your book, too, because uh, the thinking was is the reason they target the student because Chief Moose came out, one of the press releases of the press conferences, they, they, they talked about how schools were a target and stuff and how we had to protect the schools, right? Yeah, he, he had, uh, I mean, typical, you know, law enforcement response is to, you know, look at the schools and take care of those. And so they were put on an alert status and, um, you know, p- parents were concerned. I mean, nobody understood what was happening with these shootings at this particular time. 
Um, you know, a guy mowing a lawn, a guy cleaning his car at a gas station, a woman sitting on a bench. You know, the, the, this was just craziness, what was happening. So, yeah, I mean, parents had uh, uh, a reason to be fearful, you know, for their kids. So, uh, you know, the chief came out. I think any chief would come out and say, you know, your your kids are safe. You, you need to reassure that community. But they, there's no doubt they were listening. And um, they, they t- yeah, they, they took that and um, shot that 14-year-old boy, Iran Brown. And um, he got back into the car with his relative, who was a nurse, and she she was able to get him to a hospital. He he survived his wounds, um, but it was a critical point, not only you know elevating the the temperature of all the law enforcement people involved, but it also provided a couple of pieces of evidence that were critical moving forward. Uh, Part of the marshal service response that day was a deputy U.S. marshal by the name of Mike Pio, who responded with his uh, canine uh, named Beacon. He was a, a black Labrador. And they asked him to search a particular area uh, across the road from the school. So he did. He he did what they had asked. And uh, Mike is a, a military guy and, and understands uh, shooting and that type of thing. So he, he looked at where the, the child's uh, backpack or book bag was on the ground and just contemplated where this had to come from. And he noticed a small uh, wooded area to the north of the school And so he took some tactical guys and went there and began his search. And he found a a matted down area. His dog alerted to an area, and it was matted down as if someone had been sitting or lying there. And um, a further search using some uh, cadets, police cadets, they found a tarot card. And the tarot card uh, was the death card. It had some handwriting on it um, saying not to release to the press was one of the main messages. Uh, It also had a code on there, call me God, um, which they would repeat, you know, in uh, future messages and phone calls. And and Billy, let's talk about that for a second, because that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, you want to keep that information away. But that was the way, like, even when you looked at the Unabomber, the signatures there, you look at other people, that was the serial killers who wrote letters. That was the way, uh, like the Zodiac, too. That was the way to authenticate, to know that you were not getting some kook calling in. And you could, it was supposed to be then, then the snipers at that point were the only ones that had that authentication phrase so that, you know, if you got a communication, it came from them. Now, did that ended up, did that whole thing end up staying secret? Because I'm asking, as they say in court, a leading question. No, the the early discussion was, uh, you know, let, let's adhere to what they want and not release this in any way. But within hours that evening, it was out. Um, they actually had the wrong message. Um, the, the two media sources that were publishing it had the wrong messaging. Um, so I, I'm not sure to this day where they got it from. Um, there's always, you know, that's the thing that just irritates me sometimes about these things is that there always seems to be somebody who wants to curry favor with the press or pretend like they're a bigger part of it than what they are. And I just, unfortunately, I think this information gets leaked by sometimes people inside the task force or people inside the investigation because they want to have some kind of status with the media. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, hard to say in this case. Um, I don't. I don't know how it got out there. Um, but it, it was unfortunate. But I, I'm not sure that it hurt the case in any way. Um, that they were trying to communicate, um, and that's what they wanted. Uh, it, it's it's hard to say whether they were you know wanting to claim uh, responsibility for the the shootings that had taken place, and there were shootings that they were involved in. Prior to those in Montgomery County that we had not yet become aware of going back eight months. Um, So this was much larger than than we even knew about at that time. Um, But we just kept pushing away at at what we were doing. Um, And like I said, Mike uh, Pio was critical in that and finding that tarot card. And then later on, they found a shell casing there um, that uh, was... uh, 
uh, hand it over to Walter Dandridge at the ATF lab, who became a critical part of this whole thing when he began to uh, do his ballistics exams. Um, so that was on uh, Monday morning, I, I believe October 7th, uh, when a lot changed during that investigation. Very cool. The uh, And when you were talking about the, I mean, you're going to tell us, tell us here about their crime spree prior to getting to Montgomery right. County, but that's that crossed the entire United States, didn't it? Uh, we believe they were involved in shootings in at least nine states and, and Washington, D.C., Florida, Texas, Arizona, Washington State, Alabama, Georgia, um, Maryland, obviously, uh, Virginia. Um, so, yeah, as the case evolved, and, and that's typical of an investigation that you, you kind of take a point and start working backwards uh, to what these guys are involved in. You, you create that timeline. You're interested in, in where they've been and what they've done. So that that part of it wasn't that unusual um, to to me anyway. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too. After after you know, not to jump ahead of you here, but you know, you start looking at what their motivation was, and you do a really good job of of describing that in the book how they they went from where they started to where they ended up. So it's uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of the investigation here because you're telling us about the DC sniper shooting, but it's this is a book worth reading. Everybody, this is one you really should pick up. And I spent the entire week in reading it to Steve so he could catch up on this uh, episode. But I kept uh, looking for pictures. You got to start putting pictures in crayons. Books. Yeah, I got you got when you send stuff to DEA guys, especially SCS guys, you got to include crayons, big crayons, well, and pictures. You get it on the Kindle, and it's they don't put the pictures in there. <laughs> anyway, back to our regularly scheduled episode. But hey, but but you bring up a lot of good things too because um, the, the there are so many things in motion. As you were working this, what point? Did it become apparent that other shootings in other states, not just the national capital region, because technically there are different states. You got the district, Maryland, Virginia. Was there a point uh, that it became known early on that other shootings were linked to these guys? I I think that uh, as far as my part of the investigation, I became aware that they were involved in in a shooting in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, And that was um, uh, another 10 days or so after the shooting at uh, Benjamin Tasker. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, we came about that uh, information through several sources, one being a handwritten four-page letter that they had left at another shooting scene where they mention it, and then a, a, a pastor in um, Ashland, Virginia, had received a couple of calls from them, and he, they had mentioned a shooting in Montgomery, Alabama as well. There was also a call into um, law enforcement in Maryland where they had mentioned a shooting in Montgomery, but it wasn't clear at that point that it was Montgomery, Alabama. They were still looking at, at, at local um, shootings County. that may have taken place. Yeah. Hey, I, do, I wanted to ask you that about the pastor. I, I couldn't figure out from the book, what, why did they call this guy? What was that all about? I don't know. Um, to this day, I, I don't understand it. They they just openly called and probably found his number in a phone book or something. I mean, it wasn't um, like a confession or, or a result, no. you know, absolution? Or? No, I don't think so. Huh. Um, and and he, you know, he, he was familiar with everything going on, but he did not call us. We We had to find that out through their their four page letter that he had contacted, uh, been contacted by them. But he, he helped tremendously because of the description that he provided to us uh, as far as uh, two people being on the phone. That's really the first time we start to hear that maybe two people are involved because the, the FBI profile that was being put out was, you know, a single white yeah. male white, in his thirties, yeah. just lost. I mean, it's almost the standard <laughs> profile for everything you see out there. And I'll tell you the other thing that really kind of pissed me off when I heard some of these talking heads, Bo Deedle got on there. It has to be an angry white man who did this. You know, all of these quote experts were so, by the time the information actually became known, Billy, I don't know of a single person talking head that got on the air and pontificated that actually had this called correctly. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it it became almost an epidemic that, that that's what everybody believed, because when they get the fingerprint back from the firearms catalog in Montgomery, Alabama, and they see that it returns to Lee Boyd Malvo, a, a black male, 
according to uh, to the ATF agent that called me and, and said, hey, I think they're discounting this thing because he's not fitting the profile. Um, you know, and he gave me all the information. They were dealing with another shooting that morning of Conrad Johnson, the bus driver. So things were pretty chaotic. But this ATF agent said, hey, they're they're not they're not taking this serious. They don't think this is the guy. He doesn't fit the profile. Um, and that's the danger of creating a pro you know what the else is the danger to and you hit upon it Billy there's two things I want to cover real quick that and the call you talked about but w- let's go back and rewind just a little bit when did this fascination with the white panel van start because obviously because there were four reports there were four times a dark colored or burgundy colored caprice was seen leaving the scene of a shooting uh, you know Malvo or Muhammad had been contacted a couple times he'd been contacted by law enforcement and talked to the plate had been run numerous times but yet we had this fascination and and that's the thing you talked about the media it's a white panel van everybody it gets this cognitive dissonance you know or bias going to every we we exclude everything else because it doesn't fit the narrative we were f- uh, given. And that's the other thing too. It's a disservice to the investigation. We say, well, it doesn't fit the profile. My question always is, well, how do you know the profile's right? Mm-hmm. Profile is just a, it's a, it's a, like a set of parameters. It is not the absolute description of who did this. Yeah. And I, th- I think in most cases, the, the, the profiles are based on previous crimes and who those individuals were that were involved in them. So that there, there's a set of standards that they have, and you're, you're right that they always seem to be the same in these things. Um, but the, the, the white box truck or the white van, it, it started on that first Thursday night in Montgomery County. There were a couple of witnesses that reported that. Once they put it out in the media, people were seeing white box trucks and white vans at every shooting scene. And it was it was a distraction for all of law enforcement. But I think for myself, after three or four days, I I discounted it because I think every white van and every white panel truck and utility truck in the area had been stopped and 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 go back and listen to episode 18 with Jeff Nice. That's what the one thing they started doing, too, was tagging these things so that they know they've been stopped (laughs) and checked before. Hey, you also mentioned the other thing I want to talk about. You mentioned that a call came in to law enforcement. Well, there were, there were several calls that came into law enforcement, but I think the one you're referring to is the recorded call into the Rockville Police Department. And they they kind of I've got that teed up here. Let's let's listen to that and let's talk about because the reason I said that they discounted the thumbprint because it did not fit the profile, the fingerprint. They they discounted a lot of things, and here's another thing they discounted. Let's listen to this uh, call that came in because this is from the actual uh, the snipers. Rasville City Police, love calls, the sign is recorded. Good morning. Don't say anything, just listen. Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Look on the tarot card. It says, call me God. Do not release the press. We have called you three times before, trying to set up negotiations. We have gotten no response. People have died. Yes, sir, I need Get to report you to that Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the car line. Do you like the number? I guess I don't want to put too much on the communicators that took the call, but it's like, obviously a lot of people were not briefed on what the content of that tarot card was, right? At least at that point? I, I don't believe many were briefed, no. It was kept uh, as much in-house as they could at the time. But th- this call is taking place... Um, at least a week after that tarot card is found. Hey, everybody, that is the end of part one and Bill Sarukas and the hunt for the D.C. snipers. This is the real story. This is the real deal. So stay tuned in part two. We get into the rest of the investigation, how Billy develops the information. We also talk about the book that he has out. You can find it at Amazon, Chasing Evil, Pursuing Dangerous Criminals with the U.S. Marshals by William J. Sarukas, Jr., also, hey, go check us out at Twitter, at Game of Crimes. Also, Facebook and the Instagram is at Game of Crimes Podcast. But also check us out at Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes Podcast. We have a ton of great content on there, and we've got the next installment of the Real DEA Narcos on the Real DEA Narcos Cali Edition coming up very soon. So everybody stay tuned. Part two coming out 
Bill Sarukas and the hunt for the DC snipers. 